Well, hello, my name's Tom Ward. And I'm Stuart Reynolds. And this is Too Hot for Radio, where we uh, talk about Christ, the church and culture, and any other words that start with C. <laughs> and um, we enjoy to do it, and we've been doing it for... Uh, I wonder how long it actually is. Definitely over a year, isn't it? Do you think? Or maybe... I think so. Maybe coming up for a year. Maybe coming up for a year. We should probably work it out. Uh, but we've been enjoying recently answering questions sent in to us. And you can see all the, the previous questions on, well, wherever you listen to this podcast. There should be our recent programs. Do have a listen. And also send us a question if you have one. We, we really do love to answer specific questions that people send to us. Send any questions to info at gnba.net info at gnba.net that rustle you hear is me picking up today's question on old-fashioned pen and paper Uh, and so it's a question about uh, mentoring and the question is this a lot of american-based ministries would promote and encourage the idea of mentorship Uh, an older man or woman mentoring a younger man or woman and older couple mentoring a younger couple for example it doesn't seem to me as popular in the uk do you think it's worthwhile and, and a necessary thing that should be more widely adopted in the UK? I'll tell you what, mix it up. Why don't I pray to start today and yes. then you can, uh, you can tell us the answer, Stuart. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for these opportunities that we have uh, to talk together. Uh, Lord, we recognise that any wisdom that we have is from you uh, and any truth comes from your word. And so we pray that you would uh, give us wisdom Father, we thank you that you promise uh, to give us wisdom uh, to those who ask. And so we ask for your wisdom and guidance today. I pray that you would lead our conversation, that what we say would be useful uh, and applicable to people's lives. Uh, Help us to be humble, uh, but also bold to speak your truth. And we pray that uh, what we say would, yeah, would go far and wide and would bless many people. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Mentoring. I'll just lay my cards on the line. I I really am a very strong advocate for mentoring or accountability. I didn't massively think of it as an American thing. Had you noticed that before? I think that Americans are more into it than we are. Okay. Yes, but to me, it's not it's not a cultural creation of North America. I think it's it's scriptural. I think it's the way that we are made. God has chosen not to meet all of our needs by his presence alone. He could do, but he's chosen not to. That's why he, he's given us each other in terms of families and and, and wider friendships. You know, Ecclesiastes uh, 4 and 9 simply says that two are better than one. And those lovely words which follow on in that, it's great. If one falls down, his friend can help pick him up. That's more than just about the bond of marriage, I yep. believe, but about the bond of friendship. There's oodles of examples in the scriptures, I would suggest, if not setting out clear examples for mentoring and accountability, certainly the principles there. Can you imagine how many people would not have fallen into disaster like they did if they had a meaningful accountability partner? How many moral and domestic and church car crashes would have been avoided had the people, the main players and and whatever happened, had people who meaningfully spoke into their lives. I would say, even in the States, they do talk about accountability and and mentoring more than we do, but there's, there's still more talk about it than actual practice. It sounds good. Do you know what I mean? I remember maybe 15 years ago and uh, I'd, I'd been preaching for a week at uh, a church holiday uh, during the summer and I'd been one of the speakers and uh, this young man came up to me at the end. I hadn't even been preaching about accountability, <laughs> been preaching about revival. But he came up to me in the end and he says, he said, I, I would, I would, would you mentor me? He lived in Scotland, I lived in Northern Ireland at the time. He says, I, I want to make myself accountable to you and I want to regularly be in touch. I said I would be glad to do that. Well, that was July 2004. So (laughs) it's easy to say, and it sounds the right thing to say, but to follow through in a meaningful way is something completely different. So maybe 
Let me ask you a question, Tom. What for you does mentoring look like? Can you mentor across the sexes? So I would say the type mentoring that comes to my mind automatically wouldn't be appropriate across the sexes. I just I think that the type sharing that we're talking about, which it doesn't have to be, but in my mind, the picture of mentoring is a more experienced, uh, wiser Christian speaking to, encouraging a younger Christian. And I think the ideal model, if possible, and I know this is difficult in many churches, is for each person to be a mentor and to be mentored themselves, if possible. And it might be that the at the top of that is the church leader, the minister, the pastor, who maybe has someone externally from the church who can do that as well. But I think that's really important that, that then that type of relationship, which would be different than a community group, because it's more one on one. And so you can go deeper than you. I think community groups are great. And that is where you can share some of your struggles and joys of, of Christian life. But I think it can be inappropriate at points to talk about the real nitty gritty kind of day-to-day sin areas that need to be confessed and then someone to kind of hold you accountable on and I I have a similar experience to you uh, or or at least with the the guy you mentioned from America that people talk quite a good game on this but when it comes to it it's just it's not much fun uh, often and I think to actually choose to do that and I've had a couple of guys in the past that I've done it with currently guy who lives in Scotland so it's quite far away but we make a practice of chat to each other and there are a couple of topics areas that we often want to challenge each other on so one of them would be how are we loving our wives uh, another would be how we're we doing with lust temptation in that way and then also how are our prayer lives because we just find that both me and my friend love God's word and it's very rare in fact it's never happened that that either of us would say look can you hold me accountable to reading scripture we that's just something that comes more natural to us and whereas i know for other people it doesn't but like and then studying we love to study god's word we love to read books we love to to read articles and all that stuff but it's far more likely that we'll kind of get to an end of a four-hour conversation and go mate we haven't even prayed together should we you know so that's our area those three things there are other things as they come up as well different challenges and temptations at points uh my friend recently said can you just hold me accountable so no i don't think it would be appropriate to do that across the sexes i think pastor and a congregant is slightly different and you've talked about that before and how you do that i uh, me not being a, a lead pastor i don't think i've ever met with uh, a woman for a pastoral meeting maybe once or twice but I've found your kind of wisdom on that very useful in terms of making sure someone else is in the house if it was it was at your home or if it was church the door is open and things like that but what I wanted to get back to is I think we should take our cues first from the scriptures so uh, the two main scriptures that I would turn to first would be Hebrews chapter 3 and uh, verse 12 see to it brothers and sisters that none of you has a sinful unbelieving heart that turns away from the living god but encourage one another daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness we've come to share in christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end so the reason i i use this verse is it is making very clear that believers those who love jesus christ who are brothers and sisters in christ it mentions twice there that you not be hardened by sin. And so I think we need to be radically fighting against sin in our lives. Be aware that sin has a hardening impact on your heart. And so how do we get away from that? Well, we are to encourage one another daily. And the word in Hebrew there for encourage is an incredible word that means to exhort, to rebuke, to get alongside, to encourage. It's, it's like one of those magic Greek words that has about 20 different meanings. But at the root of it is this kind of, it is encouragement, but it is also challenge and rebuke. And so the way that we make sure that we're not hardened by sin is to regularly, and obviously here it's talking about each day, so I think regularly encouraging, challenging, rebuking someone else in terms of sin. Otherwise, you are allowing yourself to be hardened more and more by sin. And um, anyone who thinks I'm above this or 
actually, I, I don't have anything that I need to confess, or actually, I can just deal with it. Me, just between me and God, I think you ignore the reality of this verse that encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today. And the other verse would be Galatians 6, where it says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the spirit, or in some of the other translations, it says you who are spiritual should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So again, I think there are appropriate ways to do this, which would be if you're going to Uh, challenge someone in their sin you need to go to them obviously Matthew 18 first on their own you who are spiritual so there is an understanding here that those of you who are stronger place spiritually and again we're not I think we're just nervous of this sometimes in church of saying that there are people who are further on in their spiritual life look Stuart you are further on in your spiritual life than me that is just fact you've been alive longer than me you've been a Christian longer than me Christian longer than me you've been in ministry longer than me you've been a parent longer than me like that is absolutely fine sometimes we want to kind of we want to flatten everything out to mean that all of us are the same there are things that I can learn from you that you wouldn't learn from me and I appreciate the humility that I have received from I've asked a few people in the past to be uh, mentors to me and often it comes from this kind of and then the person will say yeah but I've got so much to learn from you as well and I'm like that's great But that's not really what I'm after. I need someone who is willing to challenge me on my sin. And I have found that even people who are far more spiritual than me, far further on in their spiritual life, are still very nervous to challenge sin. So I call you, as a person listening today, are you willing to be challenged on your sin? Would you be willing to open up the Pandora's box of your heart and actually share what's going on? And also, are you someone that would be willing to challenge someone? And not just ask them, but actually go to them and and bring up the same issue. We talked about X last time we met. How are you doing with that? It seems so simple when you say it like that, but I have found people get very nervous and find it very difficult to do. I understand exactly what you're saying. I think it's very frightening, although it's needful to have a mentor. Because how many people do you know in your experience who you could trust with a devastating secret, I mean, really Mm. trust, to the extent that they wouldn't even tell their wife what you had told to them. There are are very, very few people, I think, who can be trusted to keep a, a confidence. I am accountable to my wife. She always knows exactly who I'm with, where I am. As a pastor, have I told her everything that a person would tell me? No. But she knows who I've been with. She knows, always knows where I am. And one of the wonderful things, Tom, when we were in the pastorate is when somebody would, and I'm talking here about a pastoral relationship, not a mentorship, but it's this idea of confidentiality. Time and again, when we were in the pastorate, and somebody would come up to my helm and say, oh, I suppose Stuart told you about, because they just took it for granted, I would tell her. Mm. And Helen said, well, well, no. And isn't that great? That was great when that happened. But you see, as much as I love my Helen and she's she's my spouse, she's she's my best friend and all the rest of it, my accountability in terms of somebody speaking into my life needs to go beyond that. Because what if my area of unfaithfulness, for example, is in regard to her? And so my mentor is is a fellow, all the, through these podcasts, you've heard me maybe talk about a guy called Richard. His name is Richard Reed. Richard Reed is my mentor, above all others who would speak into my life. And there, there's a word that you have mentioned a few times about challenging us. And that's right. Richard would ask me challenging questions. But let me tell you, even beyond my own family, There is nobody in my whole life, and I've only known Richard 20 years, who has championed me more than him. And so we have to remind ourselves, we're not talking about a schoolmaster. We're not talking about some kind of teacher or instructor. We're talking about a mentor. Maybe other people would call it a coach. And that's okay. You know, if we realise that the coach sometimes has to be stern... But there is nobody who has championed me more as a person and as a ministry than Richard Reed. 
and there has nobody who has asked as the, the probing questions into my life like he has because he's earned the right to when I started in the ministry or soon after uh, I started in 1991 round about in the mid 90s was when churches were becoming aware of the fact of we talked about buddy systems at work and and things like that and they thought it would be a good idea and it was a good idea that new pastors should have a mentor a, a buddy but do you know something it never worked because for a buddy system to work for it to be meaningful you know if we're going to be truthful with each other it can't be imposed some objective person pulling two names out of a hat and saying right ministers you two I want you to buddy up together you know that will only take you so far I, I would actually suggest probably not very far it has to be sought I agree, I agree with that the idea of church is is that it's a mixture of ages backgrounds cultures because that is what the that's what the kingdom of heaven's going to be like so we we don't get to choose who we're in church with but that does mean that there is a bit of an arbitrary relationships there which can make accountability much harder and so I think on this specific thing of mentoring and accountability which I think accountability is found in mentoring but it might not be always the other way around um, I see accountability more as a uh, can be done in a peers type situation mm-hmm. and my, my, my mentor Richard he practices what he preaches he turns 81 this month 81 wow. Wow. and he has an accountability partner <laughs> that's amazing how old is his accountability partner? I actually think he's a bit younger, younger. Yeah. but what I'm saying is it's not somebody that's a teenager. Of course. You know, yeah, yeah. But I think the older and wiser, I mean, for example, we read this in Deuteronomy 1, uh, when, when God is, is telling Moses again, you are not going to be the one to go into the promised land. And he says, verse 38, but your assistant Joshua, son of Nun, will enter it. Encourage him because he will lead Israel to inherit it. Now, not even reading between the lines, is that, are we going to really suggest that, that, that Moses did not mentor Joshua or Paul did not mentor Timothy or Barnabas didn't mentor Mark, whom he had the big disagreement with Paul over? And then these verses from Titus 2, if I could read from verse 3 following, likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything, set them an example by doing what is good. Then it says, in your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, soundness of speech that can't be condemned. There's a sense, a very real sense, and probably the primary sense, that that is maybe a more general thing. But surely, the further application of it, it's just a, uh, the, the, the mentoring relationships, just a, a, a single example of, of, of the same principles. We need to allow people to speak into our lives. And interestingly enough, you asked our listeners a question earlier on. How willing are you to let somebody speak into your life? Do you remember uh, it's in Second Samuel 11 when, when David, he should have been at war. See, there, there was the first thing. He became careless. Mm. He, he, this is on the heels of his victories. He's got peace on every side. He didn't do what he, he became careless. He found himself with more time in his hands. Nobody felt comfortable. He's the king, so nobody's going to say to him, why are you not off with the troops? Yeah. Then he sees Bathsheba. When he saw her bathing, the Bible says in verse 3, he sent someone to find out about her, and the man said, isn't this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam and the wife of of Uriah the Hittite whoever that servant was he's talking to the king the king could have his head but he's saying this is the wife of Uriah the Hittite she's a spoken for woman you know and to me that was an attempt to to ask a question and a challenge and, and, and hold the king to account obviously David was was too blind or whatever but he was not willing to let somebody speak into his life at that point and uh, it doesn't matter who we are we need to find at least one person who has for want of a better phrase 
done it all. Mm. You know what I mean by that? Yeah. They have experienced it. They've experienced the highs and the lows. They are the real deal. You can tell from the fruits of their lives that uh, they really are the real deal with God. And we need to find at least one person, allow them to speak into their to our lives. And in a lot of those times, there might be nothing of weight that passes between you because things, you know, are going okay. You know, it doesn't need to be a miserable time. As I said, it is not the headmaster you're getting called to his office because that would not work in a mentor in a relationship. But this is somebody who you know is committed to you. They don't want to see you fall. They want you to make it, which is why they will speak truth into your life, whether you like it or not. Yeah, and I think just coming back to what you'd said about someone championing you, I think that's, it's so true that, yeah, you don't want to see this as simply getting told off or your kind of confession booth. I do think confession can be part of it. But again, kind of just someone teaching you and directing you and just speaking into your life, speaking truths of the gospel. And I think you mentioned Barnabas and John Mark, because that's an area where the Apostle Paul, as, as gifted and as an incredible man as he was, he'd kind of given up on John Mark, hadn't he? Because he was, John Mark, we don't know fully what happened, but he, he kind of deserted them mid-missions trip. And and so Paul's like, right, I'm done with this guy. He's clearly not, he's not wise enough. He's not, he's not built up enough in the faith to be able to, to be with us. And so obviously Paul and Barnabas disagree with this. But Barnabas takes John Mark in hand. And we don't know again what's happened. But how is it then that later on in his ministry, Paul says, John Mark, he, he's useful to me right. in the ministry. And so praise God for Barnabas. Whatever right. he did, and obviously known as an encourager, he's got alongside John Mark and said, look, that was a mistake. Let's encourage him. And he, he builds him up. He doesn't give up on him. He is his advocate, spokesman for him, and then obviously uh, brings him around to be really useful in the ministry. And so if you are younger or not so younger, if you're a person, Christian in church, just look for someone who you think that person could speak into my life. They could be a champion for me and someone that I could share my struggles, my frustrations with, then go and ask them and say that I'm willing, you know, to, to, to be open with you if you can handle that. And hopefully they'll be wise enough to say no if they can't. A few things I would encourage you to do in your time would be to pray together, read scripture, and not just, not like preaching, but actually just the reading of God's word itself is powerful enough. Confess, then challenge but also, as we said, encourage each other. Be an advocate, be a spokesperson, and um, who knows what the Lord could do in that relationship over the many years. Obviously, Stuart, you've had a mentor for, for a number of years, yep. and um, I think you can just see just great worth in that. And, uh, and can I tell you something? The one time that I did not take my mentor's advice led to my most drastic mistake of my life to date. Wow. And both my wife and I often say, if only we'd listen to Richard. You know, and just a couple of verses, if, if, you, if you wouldn't mind. Proverbs um, 27 and 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. There's an example of why we need each other and we need somebody. But also this, Proverbs 19, verse 2, It is not good to have zeal without knowledge, nor to be hasty and miss the way. And we need somebody who will speak into our lives and say, maybe you just need to wait another day before you do that or just have a think. That example where I didn't take Richard's advice, it was not a, a, a sinful matter or, or a moral thing. It was just a very, very foolish decision made with the best of intention. But I had said to myself, well, Richard doesn't really understand this. Mm -hmm. Golly, you know, and, and I really believe that, you know what I mean? And that this was going to be an exception, you know. And although he's in the States, you know, and we have our best conversations face to face, but we're in contact every single week, at least by, by email uh, in some form. And uh, it's the, I'm dreading the day God takes him to heaven. Dreading the day. Mm -hmm. But it's not today. Amen to that. And, uh, on that note, we will bring it to a close. Such important stuff. And again, we'd really be interested to hear your take on it. Have you struggled to find a mentor? 
Have you been a mentor yourself and, and what has your experience been? Uh, send us an email to info at gnba.net, info at gnba.net. And we'll be back very soon with another, uh, with another podcast. Music.